Good morning, everybody. How are you? How's everyone doing? Good? It's great to be here, isn't it? The house of God. That was a lovely worship this morning. It was so good to see Ross as part of our, our worship today. Um, sorry about those of you that studied and read uh, the verse in the messenger, but uh, I'm preaching the same message, but I just felt like there was a different passage of scripture that we needed to share from. And so that's what I wanted to do today. Can we have a word of prayer this morning? We just need the presence of well, Jesus is here. But the Holy Spirit, we want to invite him. Father, thank you so much that we can gather together here as the body of Christ. We are your body, Jesus. And we pray this morning as we gather around the word that, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, you're able to speak to us um, through the, the reading. You're able to speak to us through the things that I might share. But the most important thing is the Holy Spirit is that you take truth and that you place it in our hearts. And Lord, whatever it is that we need to hear this morning, uh, whoever we are and we have maybe something different that we need to hear, my prayer is that it would bring life, that it would bring faith, that it would bring hope, that it would bring encouragement. For you, O Lord, are a gracious Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before I start, I just want to go to the NIV version of what we've just read. Because uh, in the uh, ESV version, it uses the word exhorted, uh, where it says that Barnabas came and exhorted. But in the NIV, in verse 23, it says, When he arrived and saw the grace of God, what, saw the grace of God, what he had done, he was glad and he encouraged them all to stay faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. On uh, Tuesday, the COT and, and Ryan, Pastor Ryan and myself, I uh, got together and we did a kind of like a team building exercise I'd asked our leaders to do uh, a few days before we got there. It was a thing called ICNU. If you go to the slide there, go through a couple of, uh, of slides there, uh, Sonia, uh, Rose. Uh, I just want to go where it says ICNU, if we can bring that up, please. Should be the second slide through. No, go back. If we go back, keep going, keep going, keep going, and again. Well, there you go, it's gone missing. Maybe I, did, I put it in there, I thought, okay, my, it's my bad. Not your bad, Sonia, mine. I'll take full credit for that. Okay, so I asked them to, to entertain this thing called I-C-N-U, spelled I-C-N-U. And what it just stands for is the idea of as we gather together and, and, and spend time together, we see things in other people and sometimes we see things that others don't. It might be a character quality, it could be a, a prophetic gift, it could be a gift or a talent that perhaps others don't see. But as we spend time with each other, it gives us an opportunity to sometimes just to speak at words of encouragement. And how many of you like to have a word of encouragement every now and again, don't we? We all like to have a word of encouragement. And so what I asked everyone to do was to pray about all of the different uh, members that would be at our retreat and bring an I see in you for everyone. So a word of encouragement. And so I want to share with you with permission some of the I see in you's as part of our message that I brought to the retreat. Uh, I, I said to Sue Healy, uh, God had dropped a passage of scripture in my heart, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said this, Sue, I see in you a woman who has a great trust in the Lord that has been developed and nurtured, watered, tested and proven genuine before him and those who know you over many years. I see in you a woman of prayer in the spirit who is creative, thoughtful, diligent, desiring to see God's people empowered and released into their God-given potential and calling. May God continue to fill you and overflow you with joy and peace and hope by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can continue to be a blessing. That's what I saw in Sue as I've been here the last 12 months and I wanted to encourage her as we gathered together. And all of us need encouragement. You know, life sometimes has a way through the circumstances that, that come our way. Sometimes it can be things that we have done or sometimes it can just come against us that can cause us to be discouraged, isn't it? We can be very, very discouraged and seven days a week there's trial, there's temptation, circumstances that will challenge our faith and leave us at times feeling a little bit defeated, maybe a little bit deflated, and 
it's really good when God takes the time to send somebody that can encourage us by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can take a well-timed word, or it doesn't have to be a word, it can be a deed of encouragement that we bring to somebody else that can help them in their time of need and perhaps be the very thing that causes them to lift up out of their discouragement and become a courageous champion for Jesus again. Or it could be sometimes as we go through life, we don't see things in us that perhaps God sees in us and he wants to bring out. And so it's really important for us to be helping with the, with the leading of the Holy Spirit, to be helping to see those things in other people, to help them to see them. They may not see it, you may not see it, but somebody can come and they can speak that word of encouragement to inspire us to be confident in what God is asking us to do, to inspire boldness in us that we might believe and achieve something more than we would even dream possible. You know, God has things that he wants us to achieve as individuals. He has things he wants us to achieve. And, and the word in Ephesians uh, says that he can do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we ask or imagine. And sometimes we don't ask enough, we don't imagine enough, and we don't see enough in us that God can come along and he can send someone to encourage us or to encourage us to pursue God in a deeper level or the calling or the gifting that he has placed upon our lives. I remember as a younger man over in America working in the mission agency alongside one of my mentors and he came up to me one day and he said this, he said, Greg, there are seeds of giftedness in you. He said, but you don't see them. He said, but I do. And he said, if you hang around me long enough with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to pull them out of you one by one by one. And that's what we should be doing as Christians. We should be seeing things in each other. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we should be like Barnabas and come alongside each other in order that we can strengthen and each encourage each other, not only to stand steadfast in our faith, but to rise up into the greatness that God has for us. So I just want to talk around today for a few moments around what I want to call the Barnabas ministry or the ministry of encouragement. And it's really important that we see ourselves not just only people like Barnabas that have a unique gift of encouragement, that they're the ones that should do it all, but every one of us in the body of Christ can be an encouragement to somebody else. So as we look at this man Barnabas and here in this story, his story actually starts before that. And you know, the one beautiful thing about the Bible is you can do character studies of people and you can discover that they have this consistency, they have this faithfulness, they have this ability with their lives to be an example to others, not only just over a short period of time, but over a long period of time. And the story of Barnabas comes back to Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, where it says this, Joseph, now that's really strange, and we're talking about Barnabas. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. He was Barnabas, a Jew. He has a Levitical uh, uh, birthright. He lives in Cyprus and he, as it says in the passage that we just read, he's a man who is full of faith and he's full of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in him speaks to him and says, I don't want you to stay where you are, but I'm going to draw you down to where the disciples had gathered together and the Holy Spirit had been poured out and the church was beginning to find its foundations. And so God spoke to this man Barnabas and sent him down there. And this man, whom the Bible says is a son of encouragement, does something absolutely profound. He sells his property. He gets all of the money and he goes down to Jerusalem and he lays all of it at the feet of the apostles. That's a man who is full of faith. That is a man who is full of the Holy Spirit and obedient to the Holy Spirit. And he wants to be an encouragement. So he comes and he brings that and places it at the feet of the apostles. And there we see in this particular story that the apostles then gave him a nickname. They call him not Joseph, but Barnabas. And that name Barnabas meant son of encouragement. There was just something in him that they saw. They saw in this man an encourager. It's not, encouragement wasn't kind of something that he did, but it was who he was. That everywhere he went because of his faith, everywhere he went because of the Holy Spirit that was in him, he was able to be used by God to bring encouragement. He seemed to have a gift 
to know the right thing to say at the right time. And that's what God wants you and I to be. He wants us to be people that are trusting in God, uh, people of the word of God and people of prayer and, and people of the spirit, that at the right time we can have an opportunity to see something in somebody else or God may show us something that he wants us to speak into the life of somebody else and we can be like this man. This man was the incarnation of encouragement. Just as Jesus was God in human flesh down here on earth, Barnabas was a man who didn't just encourage people, but he was an encourager. They saw that as his character and that's what they named him. I wonder if we got a nickname by others around us. I wonder what that would be. Have you ever thought about that? Is What would people call me? I mean, to my face, not behind my back. <laughs> what is that legacy that we live and that we have? And so here in our text, we hear this wonderful story. We see this wonderful story that God is at work and God is moving. At Acts chapter 8, we see the persecution of the church in Jerusalem. And as a result of the persecution, God begins to release uh, the Jewish believers and they begin to go out to Phoenicia and Cyprus and to Antioch. They begin to speak to the Jews, but then there are some who from Cyprus and Cyrene, they begin to speak to the Greeks. And as the message goes out, men and women begin to be saved. The grace of God begins to be poured out and the church begins to grow in Antioch, north of Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem hear about this and so they make a decision. We need to send somebody. We need to send somebody that will have the capacity to encourage them in their faith. And in our faith, we need people that will encourage us. He went there to encourage them to stand strong in their faith in the Lord. He goes up there and in verse 22 it says, News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. He arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. That's what encouragers do. When they step into a person's life or they step into a situation, they are looking to see where the grace of God is at work. That's what we need to be. People, where is the grace of God at work? Where does the grace of God want to work? And how does the grace of God want to work through you and I? It says that when he saw what was done, he was glad and he encouraged them. He came alongside them and he spoke into their lives out of his understanding of the scriptures. He spoke into their lives out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit that was in him, out of his relationship with God, out of that overflow. He was able to bring encouragement to these new converts. He was a people person. He cared about people and that's what we need to be in the kingdom of God. We need to be about people and we need to be about how we can find ways to encourage each other in our faith. But Barnabas was more than just an encourager. Barnabas was what I want to call this morning a hero maker. He was a man that saw things in other people that other people perhaps didn't see. And he would take a risk and he would champion others in order that they might find out their God-given destiny and potential, step into it and fulfil it. And one of the great examples comes in the life of Barnabas is in the life of the Apostle Paul. How many of us here have heard about him? we all heard about the Apostle Paul, the great missionary, the great church planter, the great soul winner of the book of Acts. Three missionary journeys and the author under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that writer of 13 of the books of the New Testament. But Paul's beginning came on the road to Damascus when he was saved and when he was then filled with the Holy Spirit. But it was Barnabas the encourager that saw in Paul what the other disciples either could not see or were afraid to see. And in Acts chapter 9 and verse 26 we read this. Paul, when he came to Jerusalem, tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. Not believing that he was really a disciple, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus the Lord. Paul got his start. Paul got connected to the disciples because the son of encouragement saw in Paul the Holy Spirit. He saw Jesus in him. He saw the potential in him and he came alongside him and he encouraged him by taking a risk and introducing him to the disciples. 
And you and I can be hero makers as we step into the lives of other people and we encourage them by our words, as we encourage them in the things that we see, as we encourage them in the way in which God wants to move and operate in each other's lives. You and I can be hero makers. That was a great story that you used in communion, Rob, about Moses, because many of us don't feel like God can really use us. Uh, there's a great uh, teachings that you can bring out of there are the five excuses that Moses used. And all of us use excuses why God can't use us and God can't uh, anoint us and God can't do something great in and through our lives. We don't always see what others see, but more than that, we don't always see what Jesus sees in us. I think of the story in the book of Judges where the Israelites are under the oppression of the Midianites and there in that place there is a man named Gideon and Gideon is hiding. He's fearful like the rest of the Israelites. And as he's down there in the wine press and, out there and he's threshing the wheat, God comes. He turns up and in verse 6, God looks at him and he says, The Lord is with you, Gideon, you mighty warrior. And I'm sure that when Gideon did that, he probably did what we do when God comes to us sometimes. He went, who, me? <laughs> Surely not. Or like Moses, we say, who am I? Who am I, God, that you could use me to do something great? Who am I that you could use me to do something meaningful for the kingdom of God? Who am I, God? But God saw what Gideon would become, not who Gideon was. Barnabas saw something in Paul of what he would become, not what he was and that's what you and I need to be we need to be full of the Holy Spirit and faith we need to be looking for the evidence of the grace of God at work in people's lives and asking God how can I come alongside somebody and strengthen them in their faith and help them to become what God wants them to be can I share another I see in you with you if I can find it here it is this is another one I won't read the scripture because it's quite long but this was for Elaine Bailey. Didn't she do great leading us in worship with the team today? I said this, I felt God put this in my heart. Elaine, I see in you a woman who fears the Lord and is to be praised for your love of God and the love, kindness, ministry and hospitality you so freely offer to others that flows from the heart of a shepherd that God has placed within you. You are a woman of the word, prayer and the spirit and God and the wisdom, grace and anointing that resides within you, God will release again and again to bless those whose lives you intersect with. We can all be hero makers. We can all be encouragers like Barnabas. I just want to just for a few brief minutes and then come to a close, talk about what were some of the things about Barnabas' life and his life of encouraging that we can learn from here this morning. How was it that he was able to encourage people to stand firm in their faith and to become the people that God wanted them to be. Well, firstly, he encouraged others by the words that he spoke. In verse 23, it says, When he arrived, he saw the evidence of the grace of God, and he was glad. He encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. If you have a look in the ESV, it says he exhorted them. And what's that mean? He just used words, words that flowed out of a life of faith, words that flowed out of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He was a man of the Spirit and he was a man of the Word. And when we are going to be encouragers, it needs to flow out of our relationship with Jesus and his Word. The Word of God is alive and active. It is powerful able to discern between the soul and the spirit and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Faith cometh, it says in Romans 10 verse 17, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. As we are people that read his word, as we are people that put it into practice, as we are people that invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word to us, that word to us becomes faith, not only for our lives, but as we are transformed by the word, we are then able to speak that word into the lives of others and see them transformed. He spoke words of faith, words of inspired by the Spirit, and words that would draw them near to Jesus. I notice what I said there, he wanted them to remain strong and steadfast in the faith. So as we're encouraging one another, it's around our faith, it's around our relationships with Jesus. It's how do we help people draw closer and closer to Jesus? He understood the power of life and death reside where? In the tongue. Proverbs 18.21 declares that and 
the words that we speak to one another can be like a scalpel. And we've all probably seen a scalpel. Maybe you've had surgery and under the hands of a skilled surgeon, a scalpel is a wonderful thing because it can bring healing. But you take that same scalpel and you put it in the hands of a criminal and it can actually cause destruction. And so the words that you and I speak to one another needs to be words that will build up and words that will encourage. Everything in life sometimes seems to take a long time to build, doesn't it? And our lives and our reputations and our faith and our maturity, and that, 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 that can take a long time to build up. But you know, just the wrong words spoken in the wrong way can bring a person's life down in a flash. I remember when I was living in America in, in Kansas City, can't remember if we were there live or watched it on TV, but I remember they had built a building and they were telling how this building took 12 months to build. But when those demolition explosives set off, it took 10 seconds to come down. And we need to be aware in our relationships with each other in the body of Christ and in the relationship with the family that it is right to have conversations. It is right to, as it says in Ephesians 4 and verse 15, speak the truth in love. Flowing out of the previous passage of Scripture where it's talking about how we are to be equipped for works of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, that we might become mature. And part of that is the speaking of truth in love. Sometimes we have to have those hard and difficult conversations, but we must remember that we must always do it with the kind of love that God has for us. We need to seek to do it in ways that build up and not pull down. In Proverbs 12 and 25 we read, Good words can make an anxious heart glad. <laughs> You may be around somebody that's dealing with worry or dealing with a difficult circumstance and you may have a good word that God will tell you to go and speak into the life of that person and it may be the very word that causes the anxiety to leave and for them to draw close to God. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says, A soothing tongue is a tree of life. How many of us need life? We need life and we need to be people that speak life, the life of Christ. We need to speak the life of his word. We need to speak the life of his spirit. Proverbs 25, like apples of gold in a silver setting is a word spoken in the right circumstances. How valuable that is when we speak the right word at the right time in the right circumstance. Is there a criteria for measuring our speech? Well, perhaps Ephesians 4.29 for this morning could help us. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That word unwholesome talk, the term used there is actually describing rotten fruit or decaying trees. I don't know about you, I've got to be honest, for confession here, I don't eat a lot of fruit. Probably should eat more. But I do know there's one thing I don't like, is I don't like to eat rotten fruit. I, I don't like to eat food that has been decaying, and that's what we need to be aware of in our relationships with each other. Are the words we're speaking, are they to build us up and to encourage us, even if it's in the midst of a strong conversation that needs to be had, or are they rotten fruit? Are they like a decaying tree? Are they insensitive? Are they offensive? Do they bring hurt? Do they bring damage to the hearer? Do they drag others down? Rather than build up and encourage one another. In, in our prophesying and in our preaching and in our personal conversations, we do well to ask in any engagement that we have with each other, is will this build the other person up? Will it minister to their needs? Will it benefit those who listen? Or will it pull them down and discourage them in their faith. We need to be so aware of how we speak to each other, how we communicate with each other, how we build each other up in the faith. Secondly, Barnabas encouraged others by the way he lived out his life. I know as I get ready to turn 67 in just a couple of months, I often think about finishing well. Finishing well in full-time ministry, whenever that may be. Finishing well in my marriage, finishing well in life. Finishing well in a career, in a ministry. Finishing well in our spiritual walk with Jesus. 
And when I look at the life of Barnabas all the way through the book of Acts, I see somebody who not only finished well, but he lived well. Across 20 years of ministry that is expressed in the book of Acts, we discover a man who worked hard and diligently to be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because everything we do in life and all we do in ministry and how we engage one another always flows out of the overflow of Jesus in our life. We can touch people with ourselves or we can touch people with the Holy Spirit who is in us. We can touch people with our words or we can touch people with the word of God. We can touch people with the words that God puts into our heart. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that have been placed in the body of Christ for the common good. And two of those are the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. God can speak to us out of his word by his spirit and give us a word of knowledge for somebody that may just need to know something or a word of wisdom may just need to know how to do something in a relationship. And that word of wisdom and that word of knowledge could be the difference in their lives. But we need to be men and women who are full of the Holy Spirit and full of prayer. And if you have a look in the book of Acts and you look at the apostles and the early disciples, they were men and women who were full of the Holy Spirit. You'll read time after time that they were men and women of prayer. They were in a place of prayer when the Holy Spirit was poured about upon them on Acts chapter 2 and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You go to Acts chapter 3 and every morning they would go to the temple and they would pray. In Acts chapter 4 they get into trouble with the religious leaders who eventually let them go. So what do they do? In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, they go back. And it says here, after they had prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. There is a connection between our prayer life and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said in John chapter 7 and, and verse 37, if any man or woman is thirsty, let them come to me and drink and out of their innermost being will come rivers of living water this he spoke of the Holy Spirit who had not yet been poured out he would be poured out on the day of Pentecost but there is this principle that we come to Jesus and we are baptised by his spirit into the body of Christ but we need to continue to come we need to continue to spend time in his presence that he might fill us with the Holy Spirit but it's not just about prayer in Ephesians 5 and verse 18 let me go back to verse 15 this is what we read Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Do not be like those who worship other gods that go out and get drunk and call on the name of their gods hoping that they might speak to them in that frenzy that they would build up, giving themselves over to the control of something else, but instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses a term, not just be filled as in a one-off experience, he says be being filled we have to step into that space we have to step into that place and just as he was saying don't be controlled or live a life controlled by the wrong spirits or the wrong things live a life that is controlled by the holy spirit and barnabas like the early church fathers and so the early church disciples they were men and women who lived surrendered lives to jesus And as we surrender our lives to Jesus more and more, as we walk in obedience to him, as we're willing to empty ourselves of those things that the Holy Spirit would point out to us in our lives, as we're willing to lay them down, it opens the pathway for us to be more and more filled with his spirit. He was a man of the spirit. He was a man of the word. Lastly, Barnabas encouraged those who were wounded. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 36 to 40, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch and they're about to go on their second missionary journey. Paul's all excited and he says, come on, let's go Barnabas. But Barnabas says this to him. He says, no, I want to take Mark with us. And Paul says, no, we can't do that. Because earlier on they had gone out on a missionary journey and Mark, when they got to Pamphylia, had turned back 
for whatever reason it was. And so Barnabas and Paul got into this really sharp disagreement. I don't think they were encouraging each other too much there. They got into this sharp disagreement and all of a sudden Paul leaves and he goes off with Silas. Barnabas goes with Mark to Cyprus. What does that tell us? He was a man of encouragement. He saw in Mark something and he was willing to give him a second chance. You know, I wrote this down and I've thought about this often over my life and ministry and over my life as a Christian is sometimes in the body of Christ we have a ministry that no one should apply for but it's there. It's called the ministry of shooting the wounded. We all fail at times, don't we? We all fail God sometimes, we fail ourselves, we fail our partners, our children. We even fail each other as the body of Christ. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, we're told this, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin or if someone is caught in a failure, if someone is caught in an offence, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. And Barnabas was that kind of encourager. He took Mark with him, he took Mark under his wing, he spoke into his life, he strengthened him in his faith and he encouraged him so much so that 15 years later, 15 years, in 2 Timothy 4.11, as Paul writes from a prison, he says this to Timothy, Get Mark and bring him to me, for he is useful to me in ministry. The power of encouragement. The power of restoration. Let us be a people of restoration. Let us be a people of bringing reconciliation. Let us be a people of recognising, yes, that at times we do fail, at times others fail us. But let us not be those who would shoot the wounded. I'll close this morning with one last I see in you. Is that okay? I'm going to read the text here because if I don't, you won't get the context. This was for Betty Greaves. Exodus 10, 10 to 13. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered and Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. Hur. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took some, uh, a stone and put it under him. He sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. And this is what I spoke to Betty. Betty, in this story in Exodus, her is mentioned as one who held up the arms of Moses for him to be able to pray so that Joshua and the Israelites would win the battle against the Amalekites. Apart from this story, we do not hear about her again. Betty, you are like her in that for much of your life and ministry, you have been the one who has held up the arms of God's leaders in prayer and with practical ministry helps. You are diligent, faithful, honest, and have a pastor's heart for his leaders and his people. When asked to go the second mile, you are willing to go the third, the fourth, and the fifth mile. I see in you a person who does not seek and may not get the recognition that Moses, whose arms you have often held up, do. However, let me encourage you that your name is well known in heaven and God is well pleased with you. Well done. Good and faithful servant. I see in you. God sees many good things in each of us. We need to see them in each other. Let us be like Barnabas and be ministers of encouragement. Let us live lives full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and out of the overflow, let us encourage one another. Thank you so much.